Welcome to the Test Guild Performance and Site Reliability Podcast, where we all get together to learn more about performance testing with your host, Joe Calantonio. Hey, it's Joe, and welcome to another episode of the Test Guild Performance and Site Reliability Podcast. And today you're in for a special treat. We'll be catching up with Henrik's all about observability, what he's been up to. He's recently made a, a career change. And I'm just curious to dive into all the different things he's seen in performance and observability, so reliability, all that stuff. If you don't know, Henrix is a cloud native advocate at Dynatrace, and which is known as the leading observability platform. And prior to Dynatrace, he actually has worked as a partner solution evangelist at Niotis, delivering webinars, building prototypes to enhance the capabilities of NeoLoad. He also has worked in the performance world for more than 15 years, delivering projects in all different types of context, including uh, extremely large cloud testing and a lot of uh, different things on the most demanding business areas, such as trading applications, videos on demand, uh, sport websites. Uh, he's done it all. So he's he's here. I'm really excited to have him. He also is one of the organizers of the conference named Performance Advisory Council. So you probably know him, but if you don't, you definitely don't want to miss this episode. Check it out. This episode is brought to you by SmartBear. Listen, load testing is tough. Investing in the right tools to automate tests, identify bottlenecks, and resolve issues quickly could save your organization time and money. SmartBear offers a suite of performance tools like Load Ninja, which is a SaaS UI load testing tool, and Load UI Pro, an API load testing tool to help teams get full visibility into UI and API performance, so you can release and recover faster than ever. Give it a shot. It's free and easy to try. Head on over to smartbear.com forward slash solutions forward slash performance testing to learn more. Hey, Henrik, welcome back to the Guild. Uh, it's great to be here. It's been, uh, it's been a while. I think it's been almost nine months that I didn't uh, come to uh, your podcast, Joe. Absolutely. And what a lot has happened in nine months. It's something I've been seeing a lot of. So I'm curious to dive in there. So uh, I guess before we get into it, is there anything in your bio that I miss? Uh, no, no, everything is uh, completely true. Uh, you can also add maybe uh, uh, in, has uh, the, the negative uh, reflex to drink beer uh, when he has ended uh, his work. But uh. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you know what I did miss is you have, actually have a new YouTube channel we're going to talk about later that uh, people definitely should register, not register for, subscribe for, which is all about observability, which is one of the topics we'll be covering today. Uh, so Henrik, I'm just curious to know, you used to work for a performance testing uh, company, I guess is how I would see it as, almost like a performance role. And a trend I've been seeing is a lot of people have been moving over to site reliability engineering. And um, so I know you, you, you recently moved over to Dynatrace. So just curious to know what that transition is, what your new role is, uh, give people a little bit of ideas what, what you've been up to in the past few months. Uh, so yes, I clearly uh, joined Dynatrace uh, on the 1st of April. Um, and since then, uh, I uh, took the role of uh, taking the topic of observability uh, related to cloud native technology and also uh, um, anything related to SREs as well. Uh, so for, for me, uh, spending, I would say, 90% uh, of my career doing performance engineering engagements or working for a vendor, uh, for me, it was uh, the, the right timing to take a step back uh, and uh, have a broader vision on project because in performance you do a lot of things, but still you, you're still still stick to uh, um, to a specific delivery related to performance testing or performance uh, engineering, and I think uh, moving to more to the observability, I think it's uh, it's great because you see so much different technology. Uh, so since I started, uh, yeah, uh, I knew a few of uh, those technology uh, because I, due to my work. But I, I had to clearly, uh, yeah, spend time uh, digging on those technology, trying them, uh, uh, reaching out to customers, understand uh, the pain. Because uh, working in the performance since, since many years, I, I, I knew my, from my experience the, the biggest frustration, the pain that you can have when you deliver a perfor a performance testing or performance engineering. Um, but now with the observability, it's something that I had touched but not so much. So I had to reach out to customers and understand, uh, yeah, what was their 
their main issues, their main pain, and try to figure out how we could, yeah, resolve them. Cool. So, so I don't know if this is true. Uh, it seems almost like site reliability is merging into performance testing, or it's a cooler term for what used to be known as a performance engineer. Um, am I wrong? Is performance still a component of SRE? Are they still completely different? How, how do you see it? I think uh, the early performance engineering is not part typically with the SREs. It's going to be more from the continuous development or continuous integration, so more on the DevOps-related uh, topics. Uh, but the test that you achieve closer to your production environment, um, then clearly, yes, uh, it's going to be SREs. I mean, uh, I mean, we used to do t 15 years ago uh, uh, um, tests where we were doing failover. We we were naming those tests failover tests, where uh, you were running some tests and say, okay, so now after 30 minutes of test, we're going to shut down uh, the web server one. And then uh, we're going to restart it and see how we recover. Or we, we were doing other stuff with low bouncers or application servers. And that was 15 years ago. So that was sort of almost what we are naming today chaos engineering. But chaos engineering is everything about automation. It's, it's smarter. You can do more, more, more interesting disruptions on your environments. And clearly, if you do chaos engineering, you need load testing. And, and uh, the best way of measuring how reliable your environment is before you move to production is obviously combine load testing and, and chaos engineering. So I think, yeah, clearly that part will fits clearly in the scope of, of SREs. Nice, and the reason, another reason why I ask, I see a lot of large companies that are knows, mostly known as uh, observability companies like uh, Grafana as an example, acquired uh, K6. And just curious to know what is the overlap there then that you've been seeing observability companies want then to acquire performance tooling? What's the... Um, it's it's uh, it's an interesting trend or topic, I would say, because uh, as an observability platform, you try to be agnostics when it comes to the toolings that you're going to use to generate some load on your environments and and be able to ingest any type of traces, logs, or so uh, uh, utilizing um, a specific uh, in-house tooling for that. Um, it could make sense, but. Mainly, K6 is an open source project, which is a we're great. Uh, a big shout, a round of applause to uh, the Grafana Labs uh, acquiring them, and uh, to all the team that works at, Graf at uh, K6 and Grafana. Uh, it's a great tool, and uh, I think it makes sense because it's more people are more utilizing K6 as an open source product more than just like a commercial one. So for the for them, it's a way of. Uh, um, connecting all those great products that they have came up on the last couple of years. So uh, uh, Grafana, of course, uh, K6 now, uh, low key for the logs. Uh, so they have so many small solutions. Uh, and once you connect them, the story is resonate pretty well. So I think it's for them, it's, uh, it's a really cool opportunity to, uh, uh, to, yeah, to get more uh, followers and, and more fan of their stack. Very nice. So I guess before we dive in any further here, um, I don't know if people have different definitions of observability, but what is your definition of, of what is observability? Um, observability is, uh, for me, is uh, you, obviously you need, uh, there are distinct pillars that, that comes in observability, but for me is uh, being able to get all the, the uh, relevant information related to your system and your environment or, or even your car, uh, and that will help you to understand. So uh, understanding a situation and then you can, from the data that you have received, you can do the right, take the right actions, uh, either automatically or manually. And I think the um, on the observability stack, um, especially in the IT world, uh, to be able to understand, there are, of course, the traditional, I would say, monitoring approach where we're going to collect some metrics, either... Uh, application or framework based uh, metrics or customized metrics that I have also I'm exposing metrics from my application and I want to ingest it because it will help me to understand more on the business level um, also the logs because uh, I mean we we all writing logs and when we code so in logs there are so many great information that we can take advantage of um, so if there's a, a problem you had a stack trace you can share it with your developers and then can be you can speed up the uh, resolution of your incident if, if there's a problem 
Um, and of course, last is, is Traces. Traces uh, is is uh, been there. I mean, most of the observability platform of the market. I mean, Dynatrace Trace, including, they, they all have been doing Traces since many years, but they were doing in a property way with their own format. Uh, some solution were able to. Uh, automatic instrument and get all the details some were less powerful but i think open telemetry uh, when it arrives um is just the ability to put a standard uh, and open telemetry uh, tell us the ability to ingest metrics traces logs all, all all the things that we 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 expect from to fully observe an environment open telemetry is doing it so i think it's great to have a open standard uh, so then if i want to use uh, today I don't know, uh, Elasticsearch, and tomorrow I want to move on, move to Splunk or Dynatrace, the effort will be very minimal, and, and or, or even there was, won't be any effort, any effort at all, because I just use the standards, and that, that is great, I think, for the market. How many people are following the standard? I know open telemetry I've been hearing more and more about, but is that like something you've seen a lot of vendors actually embracing? Uh, most of the vendors in the observatory world are all... Uh, yeah, support open telemetry in, in, a, in a way. So, uh, I mean, if you look at uh, the, the contributors of the specifications, I mean, uh, Datadog, Splunk, uh, Danatrace, uh, uh, New Relic, I mean, all, all of them were there. So uh, for them, it's, it's, uh, it's great to, to come up to, to uh, like a, a standard format that anyone, everyone can use. Um, and, uh, and then for them, it's a way also to utilize the community technology to extend or improve uh, the way they were ingesting some some traces from, from their end. So this might just be my ignorance. Um, I haven't been a hand on, hands-on performance engineer in years. Uh, I, I usually think of uh, APM solutions when I thought of Dynatrace for some reason, but now it's called an observability solution. Maybe it over, always was. So what is APM and how does it fit into observability? Is APM going away now? Is that like an old way of doing things, of monitoring? And observability is now the, the name you use for all the types of monitoring you do across your pipeline when you're doing software development? I think for me, it's just a, mm, almost like a marketing term. So uh, I think the f terminology, uh, you, we should uh, confirm that with Alexander Podelko, but he, he made okay. a, a presentation about... Uh, the history of, of uh, performance. And I think it was CompuWare who came up to that uh, that terminology saying huh. uh, APM. Uh, so uh, that was in 1970. I don't remember the date. Uh, we will have to ask Alexander to get <laughs> the exact date for that. But I think it was interesting because th they came up to that world, world, word. And uh, if you look at the, the history of the APM product, uh, they were mainly doing metrics quite well. Uh, some of them was doing traces. Logging was not so much uh, covered, and then suddenly over the the few la the last years, logs has been more and more used. Uh, there was an interest for that, uh, and I think because of uh, collecting not only metrics and traces but uh, all, all, also other stuff, um, it's it turned out to say now yeah let's let's be clear uh, we don't do only application monitoring but we do more than that we do observability because. We don't, application means I just want to look at my app and, and that's it. And here, if I'm, if I'm uh, deploying my workload on Kubernetes, of course, I've got my app, but my app is running in an environment which is uh, uh, shared and distributed within uh, our various teams. So I have other problems or, or concerns. That's why I need to probably have, extend a bit more the way I'm collecting things it um, will be interesting to get uh, the events, uh, Kubernetes events as well, uh, to see how uh, those deployments and how the workload is, is, is uh, behaving in my cluster. So I think uh, that's why we don't stick to the application anymore. We're more broadly monitoring um, yeah, the, the, all the entire uh, IT, in fact, uh, more than just apps. So... Can you give an example of his observ of observability, like the life cycle, like like an example of maybe how it helps someone, um, so people get a feel for why observability is such a hot topic nowadays. Um, I had a story. It's a story that came up. Uh, that was this summer. Uh, so it's a story with that we we have at, that happened uh, at the Dana Trace, and the funny story is that. Um, 
yeah, we, we basically are, are most of our SaaS platforms relies on cloud providers. So if a cloud provider has a major outage, then there's a big chance that we would be suffering of that outage because we rely on them. And um, yeah, we at Danatrace, we use our product. Uh, in, in everything we do, we use our product uh, because it's, it's a way of, first of all, making sure that the, the product is doing what we expect and that it's useful. And for, for, for a lot of reasons, we do that. Um, so uh, the, the team internally used it and they, uh, they basically detected the problem through collecting all the various uh, monitoring events from the cloud providers, from other environment. And then because of all the nature of the, the, the Danatrace product uh, with auto remediation and so on, uh, there was already rules set up in case of and the auto remediation just happened, did what he had to do, and we didn't even even uh, be in touch by uh, or impacted by the Amazon. I mean, there was Amazon, but uh, the Amazon outage. So that was uh, a, a, a great story because at the end we just put some automation, we just put the right level of instrumentation uh, to get, uh, like I said previously, logs, um, metrics, events, and traces. And then we, once you have ingested everything on your observability tool, then you can create the right alerting, the right rules, the right uh, um, auto-remediation task if you, if you have a problem detected. And this is what those, our engineers has, has, uh, d did uh, that day and, and no impact. So I think that, that is just a great story. So uh, uh, not even... Not just discover the, yeah, the the next day that there was a problem on Amazon and then say, oh, that's funny because we rely on Amazon and we didn't have right. anything. So, <laughs> so that that's great. I think as a story. Nice. So, was the rem remediation someone manually doing something, uh, switching something, so there wasn't an outage where they get alerted automatically, or is it actually rules that say if this happens, then do this automation, go to this other backup uh, server or something? Uh, so yeah, the remediation is you basically defined in case of this type of uh, situation you do this so if you define several rules to manage uh, um, yeah an outage uh, because the outage could be from different sources uh, then he will basically trigger the, the right actions for that so so uh, so i think that's to define the right action that you have to set in place for your remediations uh, yeah i think like we said sre and load testing chaos engineering is the best exercise to come up to the the right set of rules and the right set of actions to uh, avoid uh, impact on your customers. Uh, so that's interesting. Then before to actually set up these alerts, then you can use chaos engineering and say, what would happen if this service we rely on went down and then fit, uh, set up a re remediation type rule within your platform. So if it actually did happen in production, then it's handled. sounds like. Correct. Cool. Cool. So, what tool, what, what technologies do people need to know to, to get this in place? Or how, how easy is it? It sounds like, oh, you just put it in the system, you set up some rules, and you're off and running. Is it that easy? or? Uh... I mean, it really depends on, because when you're working in the cloud native space, um, if you look around you, there is so many great framework and, and great te open source technology that are there. Um, so there is a natural reaction to say hey i'm going to do i'm going to do it by myself i don't need i don't want to utilize datadog i don't want to use danatrace i don't want to use new relic I'm, i can do it by myself i'm going to set up prometheus uh, i'm going to set up jaeger uh, i'm going to set up a, a lock a lock collector like loki which is open source as well uh, and i can do some nice, fancy nice nice dashboards and alerting if i want um, so that's the hard part um, but the, the, the other problem is if you do on the, goes on the direction is you need obviously time, you need engineers, uh, you need to have also the process that manage the entire observability platform that you came up on. So it's, it's work. Um, so I think, um, the, when you are moving in the observability space, it's, it's really important, first of all, to understand uh, the solution that you are you intend you were planning to use, so either a commercial one or open source. Um, understand all the the, the various framework that are there because uh, just just to ingest logs, th there's so many ways to do it, 
uh, and just ingesting logs, you can say, "Ah, hey, it's very, it's easy. You take a file and you send it over, you index it, and that's it." No, there is there is more things about it. So you need you probably you don't want to saturate your storage. So you want to uh, optimize a bit the way you're going to ingest the, the, the log. So you're probably going to filter, add more information to the top of the log. So then you will be indexed with the context of the app. Um, so uh, yeah, so even just a small task of ingesting logs could could be a project uh, by itself uh, e because you need to know the technology, you need to know the the the, the, the logs that you are going to collect, the format of those, where you want to send it over. Um, so there is so many uh, things to consider. So I think for someone that starts uh, and start working in uh, in that space, cloud and, and observability, it could be quite uh, scary because, um, yeah, you have to look at everything that comes up uh, on the market. And, the, uh, and, and if you just uh, look at Twitter, you can you could be uh, just uh, amazed by the number of uh, solutions coming out uh, every day. <laughs> so then you say, ah, how can I keep track on all, everything? It's, it's, it's quite scary. So you, you did mention that you've seen an uptick in companies using cloud-native technologies. Is that why there's also a correlation between people getting into observability because now there's so many things outside your control that you need to be able to monitor it uh, if a service or, or a, a third party thing goes down. Is that is that why there's a people going to cloud native technology? You definitely need to have observability in place or you're not going to be successful. Yeah, I mean, everything started with the, of course, the the digital transformation where people, they had this, this big monolith, monolith and they, they need to uh, distribute uh, their... Uh, uh, their content or services to more channels, so uh, web, mobiles, and other type of th stuff. So they have to rethink their architecture, and, and I think microservices was a, a good um, good practice. And uh, when you transition to microservices, then the natural choice say, hey, uh, I heard about Kubernetes, and it's going to be easy, and, and everything's going to be by just defining YAML files to deploy. It's It's wonderful. So let's do it. And then you start to maybe manage your own Kubernetes environment and say, hey, uh, yes, it seems complicated to configure. So uh, it seems that Google has, has a great service or Amazon or, or, or Azure has great services. So why don't you uh, use a managed Kubernetes uh, service that they provide? And that makes your life easier for sure. But then uh, comes the other, uh, the other part of the iceberg where you say, okay, so I manage everything on the cloud. Uh, I rely on cloud providers. And uh, and also, um, I need to auto scale because I want to basically uh, reduce potential issues if I have some huge spikes. But again, there is a there is another issue, another problem that comes in the picture. It's uh, it's the cost. So uh, I, a lot of um, people managing their communities cluster, they try to sort of uh, uh, build specific dashboard to figure out if they are overusing or or. In the opposite, they are not using a, 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 in, in an efficient way their nodes that they are paying on a daily basis. So maybe they could rethink the structure. So, uh, so yeah, um, moving your workload to the cloud and moving to microservices, uh, it's, it's bring more complexity because you, your application is more distributed, more complex. Uh, there is tons of dependencies everywhere. So you want to understand if uh, your services is slow due to your own perimeter, or maybe it's a new service that we just opened recently and that is just over-consuming my service. So there are a lot of questions that comes up in, 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 in the top of our, our head from the moment we, we transitioning microservices and then, of course, to the cloud. Nice. So I know Dynatrace also has a tool called like the Captain. Um, does that have anything to do with uh, cloud native and observability, or is that something totally different? Uh, it's uh, so no, it's not. It's an open source frame of a solution um, that uh, can do tons of things. You can either do the entire CI/CD, um, so it's a, it's an event-driven framework, in the opposite of traditional CI/CD tools where you define a huge pipeline, uh, YAML file, or in, in Jenkins you can have a Groovy script or whatever. Um, and what we, why we did, we, did, we decided to to work on this project is, we looked around us and say, hey, it's funny, uh, people are are building pipelines, so they're building code to validate their code, and um, 
And then they say, okay, so project A say, I want to use Selenium, I want to use uh, Bitbucket, I want to use, I don't know, uh, a set of toolings. So they are building this integration within their pipeline. And then you, you, you step back and you look at Team B, and Team B is doing another type of pipeline with other tools. So they are also spending a lot of time just to integrate those tools there. And then uh, suddenly you have team, you look at a step back and you look at team C and you realize that team C copy paste part of your pipeline. So they copy paste your code and they reused it, slightly changed it. And then you just leave it there. And then you look around one year later or maybe six months later. And then you realize that this small code that has been copied, you realize that it's it's almost in 2,000 plus pipelines over the organizations and say, okay, so who is going to maintain it once the, the creator of that code leaves the, the company? It's going to be a nightmare. So, um, so yeah, there is a snowflake, uh, a snowflake um, effect of those uh, CI, CD process. And Captain wanted to do a very simple way of describing your pipeline. You describe stages and then you... You, you notify your captain which, uh, which uniform he's going to wear. So today, uh, my captain is wearing Selenium, uh, Jenkins, or GitLab. Uh, he's uh, wearing uh, G -M J, J Meter uh, for load testing, um, and he's wearing uh, Prometheus uh, to collect metrics. So you just precise which toolings you want to use, and then because it's event-driven, he will uh, reach out to the right toolings to do the right actions on your pipeline. So it makes your life easier, to be honest. So we don't do only uh, CI and CD processes. Uh, we we are pretty much uh, reflecting the the approach of the you know the, um, uh, the launching a, a spaceship with NASA and NSA. It's you have a, a team that's in charge of uh, putting the, the the spaceship for launching. And then once it's on the ground and the engine starts, the, the, it's finished. It's similar to the IT. There's a team building the app. And then once the, the, the rocket has been launched, it's uh, almost on, in the, uh, has uh, quit the ground, the earth. Then the other team, mission control, takes over. So you, captain is the same. So you, have, you can either do everything which is before or, you, or either do everything which is after production. So uh, auto remediations, uh, problems, detections, uh, stuff like this. Or uh, you want to do everything. And uh, what I really loved about Captain uh, over the last years when I was still working in the performance engineering world was the quality gate. Um, I mean, um, when you do um, pipeline and you want to do automated performance validations, uh, at the end, some, what is lacking in our automation sometimes is just performance you realize that uh, projects are waiting 62 or 72 hours to have someone coming in, looking at the results, giving his feedback and say, okay, red or green, and then share the results to uh, the project uh, owner or leader, and he will say, okay, we can go to production. And, and this is not possible. It's not automation anymore. It's just we just posed the automation uh, to ask the, the experts to, uh, to give his uh, insights on what, what was happening. And uh, the quality gates... Uh, resolve that pain uh, with uh, reusing uh, this notion introduced by um, uh, the, the SREs, so uh, SLI and SLO. So uh, you define which indicators make sense for your project, what are the objectives related to those indicators, and then the quality gate will evaluate all, all of those objectives and will give points. And what I love is that's this, this scoring mechanism that comes out of the quality gate because then you can say, okay, for me, a good release is a score of 90. And uh, otherwise, if you're under 90, don't, you don't deploy. So I think it's a way of trusting the green, the positive that comes out of performance uh, that usually in the past, I remember we're using mainly SLAs. And SLAs, that you cannot do, um, you can have rules that are more important than the others. The notion of priority is, doesn't exist so much. So uh, if a rule fails, then it fails your test. And sometimes you, there are some basic checks that you want, but you don't want if they if they are just uh, failing. It's not it's not a big deal. I mean, if you take the uh, the example of an e-commerce application, uh, add to cart is a critical transaction, or search is a critical transaction. But uh, go to contact page. Mm. 
I don't want to block my deployment just because the contact page is not responding in two seconds, to be honest. I don't care. So that, 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 that notion of what is more important compared to the others uh, is being introduced with the, the SLI SLO, and that is just wonderful, I think. Awesome, awesome. So you seem to be on fire with observability. I think you even started a new YouTube channel called Is It Observable? So just a quick plug, what, what is this channel all about? What, what, what type of topics do you cover? So the, the, the main objective of this observable is basically uh, to bring educa uh, educational content on observability. So uh, the idea is that if you don't have time uh, and you have to work with uh, new frameworks or new techniques related to observability, uh, but then, then check it out on my channel. Uh, I, I just want to give you three, uh, yeah, uh, three uh, videos where you can explain understand the technology, the architecture, how to use it. And for each episode, I deliver a tutorial uh, where I explain, yeah, basically you deliver you step-by-step -step tutorial where you install the uh, a demo app, uh, you install the Prometheus, if you can take the example of Prometheus, and then you do all the things. We do some dashboarding. So basically, you you know how to get started. And, and that's, that's the most important st thing, especially when you're dealing with new technology. It's, sometimes you look at the documentation, Sometimes you say, hey, is that a documentation? <laughs> and, or sometimes say, oh, there's no documentation yet. Okay, so I'm going to try it out. Uh, so that, that's the, the idea of is observable. And uh, for those who are not uh, Dynatrace customers or users, um, it's not a big deal. I try to do my, uh, uh, all the episodes with uh, open source technology as much as possible. Uh, sometimes I do some exercises or tutorials where I say, okay, today I'm going to use Fluentbit. And I just want to connect it to the Dynatrace. I mean, I know that Dynatrace is going to ingest the logs, but it's just the, the case of showing that uh, taking a, a pipeline where I have some a log stream pipeline where I, I want to transform my logs to the right format of Dynatrace and send it over. So that, that's just an example, but it shows you how to utilize uh, Flintbit, for example. And, and that's, that's the idea. Awesome, and I'll have a link to this uh, channel in the show notes for everyone that's listening. So all you need to do is go to testgill.com forward slash P, like performance, 76, and you'll see the link. You definitely want to uh, subscribe to this channel. As I said, this is a huge trend that you want to get on top of before you miss out. All right, Henrik, before we go, is there one piece of actual advice you can give to someone to help them with their observability efforts? And what's the best way to find or contact you? Uh, so first of all, you go to YouTube. Uh, you search for Is It Observable? Uh, you can uh, just uh, subscribe to the channel so you will be notified on the next episode coming in. Uh, but just to let you know, there is one episode every two weeks and they are released on Thursday. So uh, tomorrow, by the way, is going to be uh, the, the release date, so uh, uh, Thursday. Um, but uh, otherwise, you can reach out me, to me on LinkedIn or Twitter. So LinkedIn, you just search for Henrik Rexed and you'll find my... Uh, LinkedIn page, so don't don't be afraid of uh, if you see a, a Lego avatar. So that's me; it's not a fake account. Uh, <laughs> and same thing for for Twitter. I also have this uh, Lego avatar as well. Why, why um, do you do that? Why? why? <laughs> ah, because I, I I'm a I'm a big uh, I'm gonna I'm a big Lego fan. So uh, the avatar that you have in on 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 uh, LinkedIn uh, is this one but i yeah. I, I, uh, I have another outfit uh, so i am collecting uh, minifigures okay i have uh, legos everywhere and and I, why i picked lego because when i started to do um, advocacy uh, i thought that legos was great uh, tools uh, or concept to explain stuff uh, it's building bricks and mm. because now we do a lot of building small microservices, small things like a bricks. So it's, uh, so I, 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 I loved Legos by the, by, uh, by nature, but, uh, I thought that, yeah, it's great. It's, it's perfect to, uh, to teach stuff in, in IT, in fact. So I interrupted you. Were you, <laughs> did you give your piece of advice, uh, to give to someone right away that they could implement to help them with their observability efforts? I think, uh, it, for the first question, I mean, observability is the, um, Monday, it's the main important step when you have to move, when you start going to DevOps or SREs, you need something that will observe properly the environment. So first, uh, select the toolings that would make sense for your organizations, uh, I would say. And then depending on the tooling, a few, a few uh, angles that I described, so event logs or traces are supported or not. 
if they are not supported, don't worry. Like I said, there is tons of uh, open uh, source frameworks out there. So maybe you can start looking at them, trying some few exercises. Uh, there is plenty of uh, uh, GitHub repos where you have a demo or, or tutorials where you can go step by step, try to implement that technology in-house. And then from the moment you have uh, did that POC successfully, you can maybe increase and, and go further by uh, uh, increment, adding more and more application to, the, to your platform. Thanks again for your performance testing awesomeness. For links to everything of value we covered in this episode, head on over to testguild.com forward slash P76. And while you're there, make sure to click on the Try Them Bolt Today link under the exclusive sponsor section to learn all about SmartBear's two awesome performance test tool solutions, Load Ninja and Load UI Pro. And if the show has helped you in any way, why not rate and review it in iTunes? Reviews really do matter in the rankings of the show, and I read each and every one of them. So that's it for this episode of the Test Guild Performance and Site Reliability Podcast. I'm Joe. My mission is to help you succeed with creating end-to-end full-stack performance testing awesomeness. As always, test everything and keep the good. Cheers. Thanks for listening to the Test Guild Performance and Site Reliability Podcast. Head on over to testguild.com for full show notes, amazing blog articles, and online testing conferences. Don't forget to subscribe to the Guild to continue your testing journey.